especially because of the midterms, I feel like we need to talk about the most important topic in social psychology, at least to students, it seems, uh, about pain and happiness. So I think a lot of people don't associate social psychology with topics like that, but actually a lot of the literature in social psychology has to do with uh, happiness and pain, suffering and flourishing. Usually I give this uh, session later in the semester and I do this on very specific uh, topics and I've only been giving this for the last three years, but the first year when I decided to add this session was during the pandemic because I could see from students' faces and the little that they were sharing with me is that they were going through a lot. Like the pandemic was, uh, was a lot. And uh, I wanted to try and help a little bit. It's difficult for me because I never hear from you personally what you're going through. But occasionally I see a piece of uh, feedback here, something that you commented on the reading there. And then I get the impression that things are not easy at HKU. It's not easy being a student at these times. I think over the years it has become more and more demanding to, become, to be a student, especially in what's considered to be like a top Ivy League like HKU. Also hasn't been easy in Hong Kong in the past few years. Pandemic was uh, rough on, on all of us. Um, and then when we have pressure like uh, midterms, uh, sometimes it just seems overwhelming. So many pressures coming from all sorts of directions. So we ask ourselves, why, why are we doing this? Why come to class? Why be a student? You know, why for a lot of things in life? Is it worth it? What's the point of this whole thing? Right? It also happens that I need to remind myself the point of pain and happiness because uh, for me personally, uh, this week has not been the easiest. So I uh, grew up in Israel, had all sorts of experience growing up in Israel with uh, uh, a lot of things that I have managed to forget mostly in the past 18 years. But then weeks like this, everything kind of like flows back up. And then you are forced uh, to have very difficult conversations and worry about all sorts of things. So both in the pandemic, HKU studies, and generally in life with everything that's happening around us, there's lots of reasons to try and understand how we react to things, um, what is pain, what is happiness, and all of that. Um, yeah, so I thought because we don't get to communicate a little bit, I just wanted to get a little bit of an understanding to try at least to get a little bit of like, uh, if you can try and share with me a little bit, uh, go on this Mentimeter and tell me a little bit about how happy you are generally in life, how happy you are right now at this moment sitting in this classroom. What do you predict your happiness is going to be 10 years from now into uh, the future? What do you think happiness on average for the HKU students is? Um, and both for generally in life and right now. So just like five simple questions uh, to, to kind of like get, get our conversation about happiness started. And as you're feeling this, try and think, what does this rating actually mean? So we have minus 100, very unhappy, to 100, very happy. How do I look at this scale? What does the word happy mean to me when I do this scale? How do I answer the different items? Do I have something, uh, a way to evaluate? When we think about the average HKU student, how do we make this kind of assessment? Okay, let's, uh, let's have a look uh, what we're all thinking. Do you have a, yeah, just make a prediction before I show you the results. Try and think for yourself. What do you think will come up on average in this classroom right now? So I have my own predictions. Um, yeah. So have a look at this and tell me what you see. What kind of patterns do you see? Interesting, not interesting. What's your what's your perspective on this? Putting the scientist hat. Yes, please. <laughs> not happy. Not happy. What do you see? Tell me. Things are not interesting. Like it's hard to 
why that much because it's like really hard and there's a lot of room. But also the many of seen that come out people are less happy also like that. So you're talking about this this one, the last one, or happiness right now? Yeah. But it's not as extreme as one would like you have a whole section of like 100 points to go even lower than that this is like on zero so i wouldn't say like super unhappy right it's somewhere in between happy and okay so maybe compared to uh the, the rest up there okay in comparison we evaluate hq students to be less happy than we are so we're the fortunate ones right what makes us more happy than the average hq students for you, I was not saying like myself huh? in general, but then, mm -hmm. like, if I think of myself as an HQ student, yeah. Okay. When you think of yourself as an HQ yeah. student, suddenly happiness drops. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So we have roles and in different roles, we see different levels of happiness. Yeah, it could be. Uh, I, I totally get that. Somebody else wanted to say something? No? Yes, please. People are generally optimistic. Maybe. Optimistic. What, what do you see? Where, where do you see that? Ten years from now, right? Yeah. We're thinking, okay, now uh, things are pretty bad, lots of stress, maybe, I don't know, environment, not ideal. But then ten years from now, we're going to be in a different place and we're going to be a lot happier. Then what's, what do you think makes, makes us so optimistic about the future? Yeah. To help us, yeah, cheer up a bit so that we can get through what it is that we're going through now. Yeah. Okay. So some interesting observations here. I really like this uh, self uh, self other comparison. Um, so sometimes we have this better than average effect. We think that we're better than others on certain things. Uh, and sometimes it could be also related to uh, happiness. Another question that I have for you, oh, people already started answering this, is that uh, how would you spend 50 Hong Kong dollars to make yourself the happiest right now? Let's say I give all of you a giving game. The professor is giving all the students 50 Hong Kong dollars. What would you do with it? I know it's not a lot, but let's go, go with it. What usually do we think about when we think about 50 Hong Kong dollars? What would make us happy? Yeah, buy things you won't usually buy. What can you buy uh, for 50 Hong Kong dollars that you don't usually buy? Buy something that is useless. Useless? Is, uh, like pretty, but it doesn't have a function at all. Okay, do you have an example? Uh, it, uh, some like a uh, decoration. So a decoration. Like, mm. It doesn't really have a function, but okay. it makes things prettier. <laughs> yeah, something, yeah. Something that would make things prettier. I like that. Yes, yes. Uh, eat. So food is uh, is a big component. Uh, sometimes when I give this, I remember uh, like uh, younger students. You're like third and fourth year. But people say like McDonald's. This is like my how I want to spend this. Uh, what is Tam Jai? I'm sorry about my ignorance. I know. Bo Boba, I know. <laughs> Desserts. Recharge the octopus card, I guess. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, have a nice... So it's interesting because most of us think about something like drink or food or maybe something small that would make us a little bit happy. Um, what What is interesting about these, aside from them being food or drinks or any other observation? <laughs> it's about self, yeah. So it's very, it's like me, me, I want to cheer me up, right? Which is interesting because we'll come back to this afterwards about how do you compare spending money on yourself to spending money on others? And we have some very interesting social psychology experiments on that. Um, yeah, so a similar question. Think of the last 50 Hong Kong dollars that you spent that made you happy. What did you spend it on? So I think, uh, yeah, I don't know if that will be food as well. <laughs> But uh, I'll let you answer this, and then we'll move on to uh, a very important question. <laughs> Let's say that you win the lottery, 100 million Hong Kong dollars, what would you spend it on? So we'll go back to uh, what made you happy in the last 50 Hong Kong dollars that you spent, food. A funny t-shirt in Japanese, interesting. Uh, it seems you're very occupied with food. <laughs> so I'll keep, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, if I just want to make the students happy, just need to bring some food to class. 
Uh, good. Another thing here. Pineapple bun, yeah, um, consistent. Investment, interesting. Uh, so just take this and put this into investment. Um, okay, I'll let you think about some some other things. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this uh, out there. Real estate, housing, apartments. Yeah, seems uh, like stereotypical Hong Kong things that we think about, right? Do, will we have a house to live in after we graduate? You know, if we want to form a family or just for ourselves, moving out, traveling. Nice. Yeah. Somebody saying I would donate a majority of it. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, take and also have family to consider. So parents, yeah, thanks for sharing. Helps me understand a little bit of your, your mindset. Uh, good. I want to start by saying um, we have a lot of findings about our uh, lack of ability to predict our emotions in all sorts of ways. So I think for me, like when I open the news and I talk to my family and friends right now, it just seems like for all of us, uh, things are so devastating that there's no way of bouncing back from this. You know, we think this is going to be a tragedy for a lifetime. It's going to be traumatic. We'll never forget this. I also remember I was going to visit a friend after I uh, finished my mandatory army service. So we have to serve for three years. So I finished that and I was going to meet my friend uh, in New York and I had a flight for uh, 2001, uh, September 11th. And I took a flight. I got stuck in, in uh, London. Uh, so there were no flights, of course, all flights canceled to the U.S. And once I got to the U.S., it was absolutely devastating to see uh, everything that was happening in the U.S., just uh, uh, horrific. And I remember everybody saying, we'll, we'll never get through this. You know, this is the, the end of the U.S. as, as we know. it. There's no bouncing back uh, from this. Now, if you visit the, the U.S., it's not that this was forgotten, uh, but there is a big memorial, a uh, skyscraper. There's a bunch of things. It has been embedded within the, the American narrative, but people have bounced back. They remember, but they're able uh, to cope. So we need to keep this in mind because even when things look very, very bad, there is a way for us as humans to adjust to, to this. Whatever the loss, whatever it is that we experience, there is a way for us to uh, to do uh, better. So uh, I collected a bunch of articles uh, for you. I'm just gonna summarize things from you because there's a lot of blah, blah here and the uh, uh, figures are a little bit small. So I'll, I'll just mostly want you to focus on like the bottom line of this. So whenever we experience loss or trauma, uh, we need to remember that humans have resilience, a lot more resilience than we give ourselves credit for. So even when things look really gloomy and you're depressed and things are sad and you didn't get what it is that you wanted or you lost uh, something or someone uh, important, we have a way to uh, overcome things. So this article summarizes a lot of literature and tries to make the difference between, maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. So what is the difference between the different kinds of uh, coping and the article is trying to say that uh, uh, the way that we think about uh, things is that, you know, from now on, from this event forward, 9-11 or what's happening in Israel or, you know, pandemic, Hong Kong and all this, it's just going to stay chronic. We'll never get out of this. This is how we perceive ourselves. But in reality, many of us are actually quite resilient. So we experience some event. It could be a little bit abrupt, but then very fast with time we kind of uh, bounce back. Uh, and this is a very different from recovery, which takes a little bit more time, like a year or two. Uh, but recovery and resilience seem to be a lot more common than people uh, tend to think, especially when they're experience, uh, experiencing uh, this event. If somebody is experiencing a loss or trauma, you don't tell them, don't worry, everything is going to be okay. You're going to bounce back. This is not what this figure is for. It's just to say, that even when we don't think things are going to get better, uh, they usually uh, do, right? This is really small. So I'll try and kind of like focus on the different, different things. An amazing website that we talked about already uh, at least one time and uh, factfulness is called Our World in Data is effect of all kinds of life events on women and on men. So they have here 
unemployment, marriage, divorce, widowhood, a birth of a child, and layoff. So for example, if we focus on unemployment, what you can see here is that uh, on unemployment, of course, there's a, a dip. For women, it kind of like stays very badly, but with a trend going uh, with a trend going up. So unemployment seems to affect women and uh, and men if they don't find work after this. But if you look at marriage, for example, uh, we expect marriage to just be uh, happy ever after. <laughs> But the sad reality is, is that it feels very, very good on the wedding day, both for women and for men. But at the end, it just like bounces back. Also about losing. So it goes both ways. The peak and the low uh, just tend to uh, come back to average. So widowhood, you can see the loss is very, uh, very big. But then uh, after a while, it bounces back. And then there's even the potential after five years to be happier than you were uh, before, both for men and for uh, women. Uh, divorce, men are actually happier. You know, after they get a divorce, women uh, also takes a while, but five years. Uh, birth of a child, layoff, uh, all those just show a pattern where there's a big dip, and then after world, uh, afterwards there's uh, resilience and bouncing back uh, to get to get back to, to normal, to zero. Now, I had this very limited, uh, so three years ago when I started this, this is what I had to begin with. But since then, I've collected a lot of data. Uh, what's interesting about this specific uh, article, uh, European Economic Association, is that they measured not only what people actually report, but also what it is that they predicted, which is a, an even more interesting pattern. I'll try and make this bigger because it's really, really small. But in widowhood, people just predicted I'm going to be like upset forever. And then you can see that widowhood actually bounced back. Unemployment, I'm going to be you know, upset uh, to a, a greater degree than I, I actually am afterwards. Disability, people uh, think you know, after disability, I will not be able to get back to normal. People do bounce back after a while. Um, uh, marriage, you know, people expect to be very happy, but then it kind of goes uh, under that separation and divorce. So very interesting that people overall, we find systematic prediction errors that seem at least partially driven by I foreseeing adaptation um, after those events. So uh, just uh, kind of like this, this misalignment. And since then, I've collected more and more of these studies. This is actually by a very famous person who we'll be talking a lot about today, Nobel Prize winning psychologist uh, in economics. So Daniel Kahneman over here, uh, talking about how we measure how we measure happiness and what happens. So over here, uh, you can see the peak in marriage and then uh, bouncing back from being fired. Another uh, paper here. And uh, then even with disability, uh, people think, you know, if I lose an arm or I lose my eyesight or something bad happens to me, I will never bounce back from this. Uh, but people um, don't, uh, you know, if you look at overall happiness, if we compare people who have some big injury to generally how people are. Uh, happiness is about the same. It's not, it's not exactly the same. So there are differing patterns, but you can see the general population uh, in blue and the red is not that far away from them. So even if we don't have something that everybody else has, or we experience something that is, is traumatic uh, for us, uh, then there is some hope uh, to that. This is an interesting question for you to think about. Take a moment to think about this. My, I'm going to describe two patients. My question to you is, which one of them experienced more pain? So we have patient A here, and we can see the pain intensity over time. So we can see the patient A experienced this, so two peaks between zero and 10. But after, you know, about nine, there is no pain whatsoever anymore. Patient B experienced, you know, the same kind of time from zero to uh, 25, but uh, continues after 10. So it keeps going up. And then slowly there's a peak here, but then slowly kind of declines after 25 minutes. So which one of these patients, patient A or patient B, which one experienced more pain? They experienced more pain. Why? 
experience short. First of the he it's only he only he or she only experienced two very uh clear pain mm -hmm. and, like more memorable than you experience a lot of times of pain in painful events. Yeah, so you're talking about not what they actually experience, but what is more memorable. Yeah, memorable. Yeah, which is a very important word here right but if we look at the actual pain that was experienced there is no doubt if we compare patient a and patient b the patient b experienced more and now comes the question of what is it that we remember i think what's interesting about daniel kahneman is i i like his uh, he's a serious guy and he's very humble so even though you know Nobel prize even though he's like one of the uh, biggest psychologists uh, defined the whole field created behavioral economics and all that. There's something interesting about the way that he interacts, even with something like a TED Talk. You know, so he has like the, the stand and all that. You'll see. Yeah. Everybody talks about happiness these days. Uh, I had somebody count the number of books with happiness in the title published in the last five years. And they gave up after about 40, and there were many more. There is a huge wave of interest in happiness among researchers. There is a lot of happiness coaching. Everybody would like to make people happier. But in spite of all this flood of work, uh, there are several cognitive traps that sort of make it almost impossible to think straight about happiness. And my talk today will be mostly about these cognitive traps. This applies to lay people thinking about their own happiness, and it applies to scholars thinking about happiness, because it turns out we're just as messed up as anybody else's. Uh, the first of these traps is a reluctance to admit complexity. It turns out that the word happiness is just not a useful word anymore, because we apply it to too many different things. I think there is one particular meaning for, to which we might restrict it, but by and large, this is something that we'll have to give up and we'll have to adopt a more complicated view of what well-being is. The second trap is a confusion between experience and memory. Basically, it's between being happy in your life and being happy about your life or happy with your life. And those are two very different concepts and they're both lumped in the notion of happiness. And the third is, it's the focusing illusion. And it's the unfortunate fact that we can't think about any circumstance that affects well-being without distorting its importance. I mean, this is a real cognitive trap. There's just no way of getting it right. Now, I'd like to start with an example of a, somebody who had a question and answer session after one of my lectures reported a story, and that was the story. He said he had been listening to a symphony and it was absolutely glorious music. And at the very end of the recording, there was a dreadful screeching sound. And then he added, really quite emotionally, it ruined the whole experience. But it hadn't. What it had ruined were the memory of the experience. He had had the experience. He had had 20 minutes of glorious music. They counted for nothing because he was left with a memory, the memory was ruined, and the memory was all that he had gotten to keep. What this is telling us, really, is that we might be thinking of ourselves and of other people in terms of two selves. Uh, there is an experiencing self who lives in the present and knows the present. It's capable of reliving the past, but basically it has only the present. It's the experiencing self that the doctor approaches, you know, when the doctor asks, does it hurt now when I touch you here? And then there is a remembering self. And the remembering self is the one that keeps score and maintains the story of our life. And it's the one that the doctor approaches in asking the question, uh, how have you been feeling lately? Or how was your trip to Albania or something like that? Those are two very different entities, the experiencing self and the, and the remembering self. And getting confused between them is part of the mess about the notion of happiness. Now, the remembering self is a storyteller. And that really starts with a basic 
response of our memory. It starts immediately. We don't only tell stories when we set out to tell stories. Our memory tells us stories. That is, what we get to keep from our experiences is a story. And let me begin with one example. This is an old study. Those are actual patients undergoing a painful procedure. I won't go into detail. It's no longer painful these days, but it was painful when this, ex when this study was run in the 1990s. They're asked to report on their pain every 60 seconds. And here are two patients. Those are their, their recordings. And you are asked who of them suffered more. And it's a very easy question. I mean, clearly patient B suffered more. His colonoscopy was longer, and every minute of pain that patient A had, patient B had, and more. But now there is another question. How much did these patients think they suffered? And here is a surprise. And the surprise is that patient A had a much worse memory of the colonoscopy than patient B. The stories of the colonoscopies were different, and because a very critical part of the story is how it ends. And neither of these stories is very inspiring or great, but, uh, but, one of them is distinct, <laughs> but one of them is distinctly worse than the other. And the one that is worse is the one where pain was at its peak at the very end. I think that's a very interesting insight. So you had this insight intuitively, but in the literature, this is not what we had. And if you think about the implications, let's think about this for a second about these two patients. If we want the patient to experience less pain or remember things as being less painful, could it be that we would want to induce more pain in decreasing levels just so at the end they'll remember this more positively? Some interesting and ethical moral uh, dilemmas here, but it could very well be that if you know yourself and how you experience pain or happiness, you'll construct your story in a way so that later when you remember that story, you'll remember this as being less painful or more happy, right? So you want to end with a bang when it comes to happiness, but when it comes to pain, you want to kind of like slowly decrease it afterwards. So if you went to a trip and you had this horrible experience and it's devastating, then don't just leave and go back because what you'll have for the rest of your life is this really bad experience from the trip. Stay longer, even if it's painful, let this decline. And at the end, it could be that you'll bounce back and then you'll remember this trip as, as, as less bad. Yeah? So even if we can do this to patients with inducing more pain because of ethical concerns, we can do similar things with ourselves. Right? Yeah, so this is the classic study from 1996. It's a very interesting read because I think most people don't think about social psychologists dealing with pain, but some of you, I think, are uh, clinical psychologists, developmental, doing some neuro. So you care about pain and you care about these kinds of things. So these are some insights for you to think about from social psychology and behavioral economics. So I think it's interesting that Daniel Kahneman, most people think about him as, you know, thinking fast and slow and heuristics and biases. This is something that has real implications for happiness for all of us. Uh, in our lives. Um, so very interesting uh, insights. Yeah, so uh, this one is more, you know, painful for the remembering self, but the experiencing self is obviously experiencing less, the opposite for uh, for B. Now, I think when all of us are trying to, uh, when we think about happiness, when we're trying to aim to be more happy in our lives, I think we have a lot of misconceptions. And I know that we all care about this very much because if you just open randomly uh, TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram or YouTube, a lot of these things talk about how to improve our lives, how to make us uh, more happy. Right? So there is a very uh, popular course. I think it's the most popular psychology course ever that is now available on Coursera. So you can take it for free if you want to. And it's this uh, one by Laurie Santos on the science of, of happiness. So you can enroll and take that if you want. They also have an app. It doesn't get very good reviews and it's only on iPhone, but there are some other apps that are just as good uh, on Android that I've seen on the, on the app store. I'll let Laurie introduce um, the, what she is talking about in the course, and then I'll give you my own take 
uh, after looking at that course and seeing all the materials, what I think is more substantiated in terms of the evidence uh, that it offers from the psychology literature. We all have these intuitions about the kinds of things that will really make us happy. We think it's more money, material possessions. My students think it's you know perfect grades. The sad thing is that the research shows that a lot of those intuitions are just dead wrong. As a professor, I started to see on campus the mental health crisis that we hear so much about in the news, but I was really seeing it in the trenches. Students who were too depressed to function or having panic attacks because they were waiting for their grades or worried about their internships. I just realized that students needed some help to navigate the kind of mental health challenges that they were facing, and I thought the science of psychology really could provide them with some help. heard from mothers who've given this class to teens who are really struggling, who are feeling suicidal, and they feel like the tips that they've learned together as a family has really kind of improved things and really helped people's, people who are in really pretty serious mental health crisis. One of my favorite responses that we've received was from an elderly learner who wrote and said, you know, I'm, I'm in my 80s, this is the first online class I've taken. Even in my 80s, you know, these tips have been helping me, like reminding me to spend more time with my grandkids and to spend more time being social. One of the most common critiques I get when I tell people I teach a class on the science of happiness is, wait, really? That's a science? I mean, when we think of happiness, we often think of something that's kind of ephemeral or even hokey or kind of, you know, granola, hippy-dippy stuff. But what separates the platitudes from the scientific version of seeking happiness is the science part. Research shows the kinds of things we really can be doing. I summarized everything that she teaches uh, in the course, and I want to emphasize uh, the following that have a uh, real evidence. So the best evidence for you to bounce back if you're not feeling good, even if you're very pressured about finishing, you know, there's deadlines and there's exams tomorrow and all of that, is really to make sure that you're sleeping properly. I think one of the worst things that we can do when we're upset and stressed is uh, to get some uh, sleep. I know that it's easier said than done because even when we want, want to get some sleep, it's not always easy to fall asleep. But we can think about all sorts of things based on science on how to increase the chances that we'll have a good night sleep. So I don't know about you, but I listen to podcasts and audiobooks, nothing distressing, mostly like uh, stuff that I love. And that helps me fall asleep and distract myself from, you know, mind going in circles and loops, just keep on banging the same kind of thing. So if I listen to other people, I listen to a story, I listen to something else. It's a little bit like, you know, your mother or your father reading you a bedtime story when you were a kid. So that helps me fall asleep. A lot of people give tips uh, that are very, that just seem very, very natural, like make sure that there's no lights and no beeping sounds and there are no alerts and put the phone away and, and all of that. So you can look those things up. It's also in the course, uh, but generally just make sure that you get at least here, you know, in the seven, hopefully more, eight hours of good sleep, especially before the exam or before um, anything, anything major. And if there's a, a you know, a big event, traumatic and all this. Don't let this uh, stop stop your sleep. So I think sleep is very important. Work-life balance. I don't know if all of you were here when I said this, but I really care about this. I don't want this course to be anything that would disrupt your work-life balance. If you're working very hard on this course and you're doing nights and weekends on this course, you're doing something very wrong. This is never my intent. So you can come to me and tell me and I will simplify things for you. Take out tasks. I don't think in general uh, classes in college or generally uh, when we study should come at the expense of our work life. Um, so friends important, family is important, doing your own thing is important. Work-life balance is the most important thing to um, you know make sure that you're happy. Making it easy for you to choose well, uh, we'll talk about nudging and self-nudging, what it means to uh, help yourself make the right decisions. So if, for example, you want to eat healthier, 
make sure that in your fridge they're mostly healthy, healthy stuff, right? If there's something that you uh, have an addiction or inclination towards, uh, let's say if it's social media and you just keep browsing all the time, there are all sorts of apps that would help you control this. So you can still keep your phone, but then we would limit this to, let's say, an hour a day instead of you just going through this uh, the whole time. So just making it easy is very uh, important. I think one thing that we really underappreciate is connecting to others. I'll show you some scientific evidence about that. But just being by ourselves is something that can get us uh, stuck in our loops. So connecting to others, being with others is very is very important. And money, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, money is best spent on uh, buying yourself time because time is what is really uh, limited. Uh, people emphasize money, you know, how much salary will I have or, um, you know, what can I buy? Uh, but the best thing that you can buy for yourself is actually time because that's really precious. Uh, I know that as uh, young folks in university, you don't appreciate it that much. I used to not, and I'm not that old, but I already have a much uh, better perspective on this where for me time is so precious i just try to make uh, the most of every moment that i uh, that i have and another thing is spending uh, things on experiences rather than uh, materialistic i know it comes from a place of privilege so you know typical middle class family in israel i never had to starve for anything or worry about money uh, too much but when my father uh, and my mother want to buy me stuff, uh, mostly the agreement that we had is like, mom, dad, I don't want you to buy me anything materialistic. Um, what I, the only thing I allow my parents to buy me is experiences that I can have with them. So traveling together, having a meal with them, something that we can experience together is something that's a lot more memorable for me than just another thing that I will keep and maybe never use or touch. Things that I don't know if they work very uh, well. I think the most overhyped thing uh, here in Hong Kong for a reason, we have faculty that are promoting this, is like meditation, um, mindfulness. I know it's a hype. I know it's everywhere. I know people abide by this. It doesn't work for everybody. I don't even know what mindfulness is for most people. It's a very complex thing. When I look at the evidence, I don't see what it is that they see. Um, so my perspective on mindfulness is, you know, that's definitely not the thing you should be focusing on. Um, talking to strangers, spending money on others, uh, gratitude, happiness journal. I see mixed evidence, but uh, I will correct uh, some of that in a second. Yeah, so I saw this very recently. So you can see this accepted in uh, June 9th. And actually, Elizabeth Dunn is one of our uh, most uh, reputable, uh, famous happiness scholars. So when she came out with this, it had a mixed message. On one, on one side, she wanted to say, we just don't do enough good studies. But she also shared a little bit of what she thought are good studies and what these are aimed at. So this is a little bit small, so I'll focus a little bit on this in order to tell you. Yeah. So she was trying to summarize for each strategy. So for example, gratitude, social interaction, mindfulness, exercise, nature exposure, how many studies have been done? A lot of studies here. You can see the number of studies. But of them, how many of them were pre-registered, sufficiently powered, and done with the best principles of open science? And it's a little bit tragic to see just how many of them don't have good evidence. So the ones that have good evidence for them, and I was trying to check those uh, studies, uh, is gratitude and social interaction, which kind of gets uh, like a little bit different than what I showed you in the previous slide. But two is still not a lot, you know. And when I read those, I see all sorts of of issues. So just whenever somebody sells you something about happiness, I would go and check that out and talk to some scholars to see what they're saying about this. Talk to Elizabeth Dunn, talk to me, talk to some others in, in faculty and ask them, so what is the evidence? Can I see this evidence? Is it best practices, open science, well-powered, large samples? Um, can we see this consistently in different cultures and so forth? So I really like this. And most recently, and this is, uh, I think was, yeah, October 5th, very recently. So I told you I listen a lot to audiobooks and podcasts. 
one of the uh, ones that I really appreciate from a scientific perspective is called Science Versus. So Science Versus checks all kinds of domains. Uh, it sees where there's something that's overhyped in TikTok or Instagram and all that uh, really has uh, scientific evidence uh, behind it. And they even try stuff out. They talk to professors. They do the work for you. So I really recommend this podcast. And they were talking about uh, a big hype, how to deal with uh, depression. You take a cold plunge. Do you know the ice baths? It's uh, very popular on TikTok right now. There's not a lot of evidence for this, but they go through some of that in the podcast. Uh, what seems to be working to some extent, if you do this correctly, and they talk about how to do that correctly, is gratitude journaling. So whenever uh, you know you sit down and you think, what am I grateful for? Uh, not so much, uh, you know, I'm grateful for McDonald's meal, but I'm grateful for my mother, my friend, this person. And then it's even more uh, meaningful if you share a little bit of that with them. You can have a conversation regarding what you're grateful for, because I think we don't tell other people that we're grateful for them a lot. And whenever you do, they really appreciate this. And it starts a very meaningful conversation. And then you realize you also matter to other people. And that really boosts uh, your you know, well-being and sense of meaning. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do, I'll do one more just to give you an example of another uh, classic thing that Daniel Kahneman mentioned very briefly in his TED talk, a uh, very interesting aspect. He considers this to be the biggest thing that he has found, which is really uh, interesting. And once you see the focusing illusion, so focusing illusion is that if you focus on something, you don't see anything else. Once you start looking at focusing illusion, you don't see anything else but focusing illusion, which is also like an interesting aspect of it. So he summarizes this very briefly. So let's see what he says. For it, TV, the world is thinking. Now you detail one of the, the many delightful parts of the book is the detail, some of the patterns the illusions and biases people have. And some of my favorites, maybe you could describe, well, you can describe your own favorites, though I would nominate uh, the focusing illusion and the planning effect, I believe it's called. Planning the, fallacy. The planning fallacy. Maybe you could describe some of your favorite common biases. Well, I like the focusing illusion a lot. Uh, the, this is, it's a very simple idea. You know, you think of, say, moving to California, or how happy people are in California. and and by and large, people greatly exaggerate how happy Californians are. Uh, and, and the reason is that when you think of California, you're drawing a contrast. And the contrast, one of the obvious contrasts is going to be climate. And they have a more desirable climate. And, and you think, and at that time, that's the one thing you're thinking about. So if they have a better climate, you immediately jump to the conclusion, this is the way system one works. You jump to the conclusion that they must be happier. In fact, climate is not all that important in happiness. But now, it turns out this is generally true. Whatever you think about in your life, you're going to exaggerate its importance. And there's nothing you can do about it. You attend to it, and you exaggerate its importance. You ask people, how much pleasure do you get from your car? And they answer a slightly different question. They answer the question, how much pleasure do I get from my car when I'm thinking about my car? But most of the time, they drive their car, they're not thinking about it. They're thinking about other things. They're getting no pleasure from their car. So that's the focusing illusion. Yeah. And, and it's important because I think it's a source of many mistakes that people make in thinking about their life and in thinking about how their life could be different. Good. So he was talking about focusing illusion and happiness when we compare ourselves to people who live in better climates. Uh, I'll show you that uh, article in a second. What other kind of focusing illusions do we have? Yeah. Last week, reading about uh, talking about getting your job or your dream job, and mm -hmm. said that many people, especially professors, want to get a tenure. Mm -hmm. They they imagine they will be super super happy when they get a tenure, but after they get it, they are usually less happy because when they imagine the things, they only think about the benefits uh, of getting the results, but they don't know other, they don't, uh, how to say, 
uh, consider other things like they need to go to more meetings or they have more responsibility? Yeah, that's excellent. That's a that's perfect answer. Thank you for that. Yeah, I don't know how familiar you are with the tenure uh, process that professors have to go through. But I'm just baffled when I talk to other professors about their happiness and how much they care about the tenure. And uh, the dilemma that we uh, usually have is that you have six years before tenure. So you need to publish as much as possible. And then after six years, you face the tenure committee, right? And, and I've been doing things very differently from what I think the tenure committee expects me uh, to do. And every year or two, they have like the uh, review saying, you know, but you're not doing according to the uh, committee. You need to publish in high impact factors, science, nature, PNS. You need to publish more papers and all of that. And for me, my answer has always been, I think you need to change in order for me to want to stay here. For me, it makes absolutely no sense to sacrifice six years of your life. We're at the prime, right? Right now, this is like the best that we can ever be. You know, we're healthy. Uh, generally, things are going our way. You know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Israel, 9-11, all sorts of things, pandemics. Who knows? To sacrifice six years of your life to do something that you don't want, that you don't believe in, just because maybe, yes or no, you will get the, the tenure makes absolutely no sense to me. And, and then we really focus on this a lot. So that's a really good example that I suffer from <laughs> every, every uh, day here uh, with my colleagues. Uh, I wish people would be able to get out of this focusing illusion. Uh, we'll have a break. Uh, let's do five minutes. As you're going, think about your life as a student, focusing illusions. I'll come back and, and I'll show you some articles. Five minutes. Okay, so this is actually a study, the, the uh, one of two very classic studies by uh, Daniel Kahneman and a collaborator. Um, and in the other class that I'm teaching, uh, which is uh, research methods for um, postgraduate, research postgraduate uh, students, uh, they're actually running a replication of this um, soon. So it will be interesting to see visiting this after, I don't know, two and a half decades, something like that, yeah, 1998, whether this will replicate or not. And this is what they uh, found. So self-reported overall life satisfaction was the, was the same in both regions. Regions are uh, the Midwest. So Midwest and Californians, when you ask the Midwesterners to compare themselves to Californians, they're thinking, what's the difference between me and the Californians? Oh, it's weather. Therefore, they must be happier. But uh, you can see here, I'll just make this a little bit bigger so you can see the small uh, writings, that when you ask people, uh, what is it that you care most about in terms of your happiness? What are the number one factors that uh, happiness matters uh, for you? So you can see that the top is actually job prospects. Uh, so it, you know, nothing to do with the weather. It's whether I can have a job or not, whether I'm employed. Academic opportunity, financial situation, personal safety is a big thing, especially in a place like the U.S. We take it for granted in Hong Kong. Social life. So all these are like the big, the big five, the big uh, uh, factors. And then you have smaller things like outdoor activities, natural beauty, cultural opportunity. What's what's like at the end of this whole thing? The weather. The weather is at the end. So you should ask yourself if you compare yourself in the Midwest to Californias, what are the job prospects? What kind of social life can I expect? So rather than focusing on the weather. You should just compare that as people do live in places like the Midwest. Uh, and there's a, a good reason uh, for that. Yeah, so a very interesting study, classic, I'll tell you. Uh, I don't know if we'll know by the end of the semester, but at some point we'll have some uh, findings. What is another focusing illusion? And this was actually published in Science. So we don't have a lot of behavioral economics and social psychology in Science. So this is a big one. Once again, Daniel Kahneman about focusing illusion when we compare ourselves to the rich. And I think we do this a lot in Hong Kong. We see somebody who's wealthy and we say we want to be like that, right? We compare ourselves to them uh, the whole time. So I think many times in capitalist societies where you have a lot of people who are very wealthy, I think Hong Kong with the Gini coefficient, the gap between the poor and the uh, very, very wealthy, is is big is among the biggest in the world uh, we tend to have more of this focusing illusion 
So you can see all sorts of uh, things um, in terms of the predictions, how, how big the differences are, what people predict and what uh, the actual numbers uh, are. Um, yeah, so when it comes to a percentage of time in bad mood, people predicted that the, the, um, the people in low income uh, uh, bracket under $20,000 a year predicted 57%, but actually 32. If you have a lot of money, the very uh, wealthy above 100,000, uh, that they would be uh, much less. Uh, but then actually the differences are not that big. So you can see the actual difference is, is a lot lower. It's like a third of what people uh, expected. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, going and just a book came out about singleism. So it used to be, and it's still a brainwash in our society that you must uh, get married, you must have kids, you must do all sorts of things. And if you don't, you'll be lonely forever. But there's a lot of evidence in social psychology showing that single people actually have very meaningful lives. Sometimes they're, they're as happy, if not happier uh, than married people. So um, you can see the differences are actually not significant at all. So, uh, so people perceived alone, lonely people, people who don't have a family to be lonelier, predicted them to have 41% of bad mood, but actually it's lower than the married folks. Um, not significant, but just generally like on par. Uh, so sometimes it's worthwhile to ask the people who don't have a family who are single, uh, what their lives are about instead of making all kinds of predictions. So. When you ask a person about, are you, uh, do you have a family or not? You focus on this and this is how you uh, end up assessing your happiness or making predictions. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, issues with that. And actually most of the things about your happiness in life have nothing to do with your income or about whether you have a family or not, but about all sorts of other aspects uh, on top of that. So terrific, terrific uh, uh, study. This is another uh, famous, a uh, famous uh, diagram uh, figure from Kahneman, uh, 2010. And this came out about what happens with the income. So it's not that income is not important for happiness at all. Uh, it's, very, it's very important, but it's important for the uh, lower class. So as you increase, uh, increases your happiness because you need the basic uh, things in life in order to survive. You need to eat well. You need to be able to have a place to sleep well. Uh, you need all sorts of things in order to maintain a certain level of, of being. But once you hit very close to middle class, lower middle class, somewhere here, then it seems to go, um, you know, diminishing returns over that. And uh, the increase in happiness does not matter uh, that much. What do you think about this? about this figure makes sense to you? Yeah, how many people think that this makes sense? Makes sense, yeah. Makes sense to me as well, and this was the prevalent kind of uh, thinking about this, but since then people have been trying to tackle this again and again, showing all kinds of uh, different evidence. This one came out and made a big storm because whenever somebody questions a study in uh, science, and publishes this in PNAS, which Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, creates a big debate. And basically what they did is that they took the data and they showed this, this diagram, uh, this figure. And uh, they're showing, no, what do you mean? It keeps increasing all the time. Uh, I'll show you the, the figure a little bit uh, bigger than this. So you have the 75,000 here, and you can see life satisfaction and experience well-being seems to go up a lot. And when we see somebody questioning uh, something that's very intuitive that Kahneman uh, was giving us, a lot of people start to look into it uh, more. Uh, and I just wanted to show you that sometimes you have very interesting uh, debates about this. So immediately, we all went on Twitter and tried to, to understand, uh, is this new evidence that shows us something that's different? So even when you see a paper in PNAS come out, which says, uh, I'm going to show you that everything that you knew uh, from Daniel Kahneman is wrong, sometimes they are the ones that are wrong. But what's nice about Daniel Kahneman is that a very humble researcher, and he also introduced the concept of adversarial collaboration. So whenever there are two different camps that have a different interpretation for the same finding, he says, Let's all of us work together. We'll get a mediator, a third party that is not involved in this race, 
and they'll help us sort out which one of us is uh, right. So they pre-register everything in advance. Only after they pre-register, they go and they look at the data, collect the data, and analyze this together. And then the person who decides which one is right is the uh, mediator, the person who uh, was invited that doesn't have a stake in, in the race. Uh, and this is what they did here as well. It just uh, came out, uh, uh, see, a conflict resolved. So that's interesting. Uh, the person, Killingworth, is the same Killingworth from here. And Daniel Kahneman is Daniel Kahneman. And Barbara Mellos, I've seen her do uh, adversarial collaborations a few times with Daniel Kahneman whenever he had a dispute. And many people want to go after the Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, scholar. So it's interesting because with a lot of humility, both of them said, yeah, we were wrong. Both of us were wrong. We didn't see this. We didn't see that. Uh, this is what they uh, this is what they say. Um, we then explain why Kahneman and Deaton overstated the flatting uh, pattern. So uh, they came to very strong conclusions and they overstated that conclusion, but also why Killingworth uh, failed to find the diminishing uh, pattern. And they had this very, very interesting graph at the end. So they were saying whether this diminishes or not is dependent on how happy you are before you got that money. So the people who uh, are generally very happy in their lives. When they had more money, they knew how to make that uh, money into something that makes them happy. If they were not happy people, the money didn't really help them that much because they were just you know, not happy. So this is their resolution, which is really interesting. So I really like it when I see science kind of progressing. We thought we had an answer. We believed it for a while. Then comes somebody else, shatters everything, saying, no, we need to think differently. And then both of them come together and come to a resolution. What do you think about the resolution? <laughs> Good. So what do I do when I see a resolution? <laughs> I go on Twitter, and then I just see everybody finding flaws in both of them. <laughs> so for all three papers, there are flaws. And the reason why I give this, uh, and I think it's also good for happiness in general, is that we need a lot of humility. So sometimes, even when we think that we know something, science is complex, reality is uh, involves a lot of factors and uh, very difficult to make sense of. Something as complex as happiness is very difficult to just have like one measure that will tell you the whole story. So whenever you have a scientific article, especially where, by a Nobel Prize uh, winner, uh, winner like Kahneman, and it's published in Science or PNAS, you're going to have a lot of uh, debate. This is a very interesting exper uh, experiment that they did in uh, 2022. Instead of trying to measure people's happiness according to social class, what would be a good experiment? Just give people cash during COVID, right? People are really suffering. They need some money. Give them different amounts of cash if they come from the same baseline and see how this affected their happiness. So uh, not just correlational designs, but something that would give you causal evidence for that. So this is their uh, a very interesting paradigm. We randomized over 5,000 US American individuals in poverty, so they don't have a lot of money, to one of three conditions during the first year of COVID. Receiving a one-time $500 unconditional cash, uh, 2,000 or nothing. And then what happens? While the cash transfers increased uh, you know, the spending for a few weeks, we find no evidence that they had any positive impacts on our pre-specified survey outcomes at any uh, point in time. So it didn't seem to affect their happiness. At uh, So you might say 500 US dollars or 2,000 US dollars don't matter much, but it is a substantial amount of money. We can do a lot of good with that money, especially in a developing country. Uh, but it didn't like even register as a blip in the comparison between them because you adjust very fast afterwards. Um, so think about how can we measure this as an experiment? What can we do in order to uh, understand this a little bit uh, better? This actually comes from China, so it's very interesting. What they did here is twin studies, identical twins, but they are separated. One of them grew up in wealthy environments and some of them in lower uh, status, and I think when it comes to scientific evidence about all sorts of factors in life, twin studies is like 
up there. This is like one. We don't have a lot of these, so a lot of people try to get to the same twins. But China is a little bit untapped, and these were scholars from China had this very interesting study that uh, they did about income and happiness. And this is what they found. Income had a much larger effect than previous estimates. Doubling income boosts the four-scale happiness value. So I would say of all the evidence that I've seen, the twin studies to me are the most uh, convincing. This is from China. Uh, hopefully we can look at some other twin studies. Uh, but I really wanted it to see correlational evidence and then some experimental evidence and then twin studies. That is uh, uh, kind of like quasi-experimental, looking at a paradigm where twins uh, have different so social status. Uh, but genetically, they're exactly the same. So you can kind of control for all the uh, genetic factors. So very interesting how to approach issues of, of happiness. So the issues that we have is that people are, of course, feeling uh, more pressed for time uh, than ever before. And then we have this dilemma between time and money. Which one should we invest in? Uh, what is it that we should uh, emphasize? So I'll let Ashley uh, introduce uh, her book. It's called Time Smart. I've listened to this on a you know uh, audio book while I was hiking and just you know made my mood a lot better. I even remember which hike it was in Sai Kong in the Maclehose Trail section two. It was very good. I have the power to make you all less time poor right now. It's true. <laughs> I could leave the stage and give you 4.75 minutes back. But I'm not going to do that. I don't trust you. You would squander that free time, perhaps by passively scrolling on your phone until the next talk starts, or if you're anything like me, answering just one more work email. It isn't our fault that we fail to prioritize time or that we lose moments of free time. Our brains get in the way. Human beings are pretty much allergic to leisure. Researchers call this phenomenon idleness aversion. I mean, let's be real. When's the last time someone asked you what your plans were for today and you cheerily replied, nothing? We also think we're going to have more time in the future than we do in the present. I like to call this bias the yes, damn effect, and it works in life a little bit something like this. Monday. Hey, Ash, can you help me move Saturday? No problem. Tuesday. Hey, Ash, want to go to dinner on Saturday? Sounds great. Wednesday. Professor Willens, I have a paper due Monday, and I would really appreciate your help on Saturday. Of course. Yes, 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 Saturday. Damn. Oh, what was I thinking? When the future becomes the present, we often wish we could take back the things we said yes to. It is clear. Our societies and our minds are conspiring against us when it comes to time. We are taught that money is our most valuable resource, our free time becomes time confetti thanks to our constant connection to our cell phones. And we say yes way too often, in part because we think we're going to have more time in the future than we do in the present. But luckily for us, just like people who are physically fit, the time rich among us make small, simple decisions in their everyday lives that allow them to have more and better time. The time rich among us prioritize time over money. No matter how much money they make, they're willing to give up some of their money in order to have more and better time. They're also likely to take all of their paid vacations. Now, this seems obvious, but many of us don't do it. If your boss were to put a giant stack of money on the table in front of you, you wouldn't walk away from it. But by failing to take all of your paid vacation, that's essentially what you're doing. You're walking away from a gift of time. They also spend more time savoring their daily experiences. My collaborator and I have data showing that the French spend more time eating and are less stressed and happier as a result. In contrast, Americans spend more time choosing their food than actually enjoying it. 
To be clear, scrolling Grubhub for hours is not a path to greater time affluence or happiness. They also spend time engaged each day in activities that we know are good for happiness. Socializing with friends and family, volunteering, and exercising, even if just for a few minutes. As it turns out, giving away our time for free by volunteering is one of the best ways to feel like we have more of it. Maybe they have more time for these activities because they're also willing to pay to outsource their most disliked tasks to others. My data suggests that simply spending as little as $40 to outsource our most dreaded tasks to others can really pay off in terms of happiness and stress. Lastly, the time rich among us keep time affluent to do lists. Each day, we are rewarded with small moments of free time, like during our morning commute or while standing in line at our local supermarket. The time rich among us don't squander this free time, they capitalize on it. They keep lists with activities that they can complete in these found moments, like texting their friend, calling their mom, or reading an ebook. So, the next time you feel compelled to take that what celebrity do I look like quiz on the internet, try texting your best friend instead. It can be hard to prioritize time, in part because unless we are paid by the hour, it isn't always easy to measure what the value of our time is worth. A $10,000 raise is easy to understand. However, the value of an additional 30 minutes of free time isn't quite so simple. But we can make time-related choices easier for ourselves. I work at a business school, so the only way I can get my MBAs to care about happiness is if I put it in a currency that they care about and understand. Money. <laughs> Um, but what I use in these calculations isn't money per se, but rather the income equivalent of happiness, or what I like to call happiness dollars. I define happiness dollars as the income equivalent of the happiness that you'd experience from making a time-related choice. Now, of course, the numbers that I get in these calculations will depend on how much money you make. And as it turns out, people who make less money actually benefit more from making time-related decisions. What we can see in these calculations is that simply shifting our mindset from prioritizing money to prioritizing time produces the happiness gain equivalent of making $2,200 more per year. Outsourcing our most dreaded chores to others might feel frivolous, but we can see here that it really pays off. Outsourcing our most disliked tasks like house cleaning or grocery shopping produces a happiness gain of making nearly $13,000 more per year. And if we add up all of the activities that I just mentioned, vacation, savoring, spending more time engaged in happiness-producing activities, creating time affluence to-do lists, we can actually make ourselves happiness rich. Who does doesn't want that. If you would ask me what would I prefer, a big salary, um, but a lot of pressure and competition and not a lot of work-life balance, or I would prefer an environment like the Netherlands, where the salaries may be lower, but people hang out together, they do a lot of things, they have good work-life balance, I would without doubt prefer the work-life balance. It's difficult because there's a lot of competition and pressures. But I do care about uh, the trips that I make, the people that I, uh, I'm with, and uh, not overworking, which is why I also don't want you to overwork for this course and for what it is that I, I'm doing with you. So this is just like my perspective on uh, time and money. I know what it's like to be in a poverty mindset, uh, but sometimes you need to incorporate time in these kinds of uh, decisions. Elizabeth Dunn again. Willens and uh, Michael Norton and a bunch of others, so Rene, uh, I know him from the Netherlands. Um, so they, they're talking about buying time promotes happiness. So uh, adults report greater happiness after spending money on a time-saving purchase uh, than on material uh, purchase. Together, these results suggest that using money to buy time can protect people from the detrimental effects of time pressure 
or life satisfaction. And I see a lot of people make this kind of bad choices. So 99% wanted to spend the money to buy time. So when I uh, talk about this, uh, when Ashley uh, talks about this, and it seems very intuitive to people, but actually when it comes to behavior, people don't do this. Only 17% uh, do this from uh, this uh, sample. Um, but it seems like uh, millionaires do this a lot more. So when we try and understand what is it that millionaires do that's so much better than us, many people think about their investment in the stock market or how they, I don't know, uh, saw crypto or whatever it is before we did. But sometimes what it is that they do is that they, they think about their time uh, a lot better than, than we do. So it seems like about half of the uh, millionaires um, do uh, invest in their time. So... And unbelievably interesting, I don't even know how they did the study, but they got a group of 863 uh, uh, millionaires in the Netherlands and interviewed them. And that makes sense because in the Netherlands, you would be able to like approach a millionaire and like ask them how, how they're spending their time, right? <laughs> so um, it seems like, so they, they looked at the uh, affu uh, affluent, uh, so the millionaires and the general population, very large samples. Uh, and it seems like they spent their times in surprisingly similar ways. So what is the big difference between how uh, we do it and how the millionaires uh, do it? It's the way that they spend their time, what it is that they spend it on. So it seems like the millionaires spent more time engaged in active leisure. So like exercising and volunteering rather than passive leisure, like watching television and relaxing. So it seems like for us, when you know we have uh, some spare time, we do something that's... Uh, uh, more, more passive, but if we socialize, if we volunteer, if we do exercise, if we do something that's a bit more active, then it seems like uh, time better better spent. In study, two millionaires spend more time engaged in uh, tasks at work over which they had more control. So also choosing something where you have more freedom to choose your ability to execute and so forth. Super interesting uh, finding. I really want to know how they had access to all these millionaires. This is a summary. We'll wrap this up. There's a lot more that I want to talk about happiness, but we'll do this after the reading week. Um, these are the uh, common traps that Ashley talks about from her book. So this is actually a screen cap capture from that. So I'll emphasize four of those. Uh, really need to re reconsider our uh, connection to technology. So we're just like obsessed with this thing. We're addicted to it. Uh, obviously in class, I see everybody just engaging with this all the time. It's very difficult to put the mobile aside or put the laptop aside or even when we're with friends sometimes i see you know couples on a romantic date uh sitting there just every one with their own uh, uh, mobile so that's a little bit sad for me so if you have a way of controlling this either with an app or physically putting this away when you're spending uh, time with somebody else that would be good obsession with work and making money i don't understand the hong kong u.s obsession with uh, making money um so I think once we get rid of that, there's a lot more potential. Limited value placed on time. So if you understand how limited our time is and you value this um, and spend money in order to gain more time, that's a good way of doing it. And aversion to idleness. So we just feel like we need to be active all the time. Sometimes it's good to just like disengage, you know, just sit there on a the beach 10, 10 minutes away is, I don't know, Stanley and a bunch of others, Ripples Bay. Uh, beautiful. You know, I don't even need to get on a ferry half an hour. You've got those small islands, beautiful beaches. Uh, Saikong is also not too far away, so I recommend that. One of the nicest things about HKUST where I uh, did my PhD is just, you know, they had two beaches and a pier. So either you can just like go to the beach or you can take like a kayak and get, get to an isolated beach. Uh, so good times during PhD when I wanted to chill. So three activities to build time affluence, just find more time. So have uh, activities that would take away from the, the negative stuff and make you focus on, you know, having more time for yourself, funding time, putting money into this and transcending this into time and then reframing time. So uh, having, uh, you know, things scheduled as like a break, just making sure that all sorts of things that you do have the ability to re-energize you. Yeah. Last thing that I'm going to show you, many times people ask me, it's great that you're saying all these things. Are you really living up to them? So I ju I'll just share one thing with you. Uh, and this is what I uh, did during the pandemic. So I hike a lot. So during the pandemic, I committed to having two hikes in Hong Kong a week. 
and I got to, I think, number, I'll, I'll try and open this now, but it's uh, it's kind of like a thread that goes up and you can like browse the 106 uh, all together. But uh, the, the basic uh, thing to uh, look for is like you can look for, don't know what people think of when they think of Hong Kong, but here's a hike and then I give like the uh, the address and then this is the one that I did next to Stanley. So like a really nice beach, good times in the, you know, some waterfalls. And this is not too far away from here. So if you want to see 106 hikes and how I spend my time uh, when I want to re-energize in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is really beautiful. I think most Hong Kong students don't realize how beautiful this place is. So I feel very privileged to to live in Hong Kong and be able to work here. I wish all of us would appreciate this a little bit more. It's it's easy to forget when we're surrounded by skyscrapers, but even here in the back is the morning trail. So are you welcome to like see my trails, think about this, what makes you uh, re-energize, what helps you find the time, how you find happiness. So just a bit of a preview, and then we'll discuss a bit more about happiness after you come back from Reading Week. So I do hope that in Reading Week, you take some time for yourself, uh, take a break. I know you have a lot of things, you have midterm exams and you have all of that, but do try to give yourself at least a little bit of time to find happiness. Okay. Have a good reading week. I'll see you the week after.